Hello. Welcome back to History 321. I'm Dr. Ron Trailer, and we are going to call this video lecture number 3A. 3A. All right. Um, let's talk about Galvez's, Governor Galvez's relationship to the Americans during the American Revolution. Well, first of all, we need to understand that uh, we've always been taught that there were 13 British colonies uh, who revolted against uh, the British government. And that is really an inaccurate statement. There were actually 14 British North American colonies. The problem, of course, there were the 13 that we all know about, and there was British Florida. Please remember that England had received Florida as the result of the uh, of winning the French and Indian War. The problem, of course, in Florida was that the people who lived in Florida didn't rebel against the English. They were very satisfied to just maintain uh, the status quo. So the British, and some of you, many of you perhaps, didn't know that. Um, the British in British Florida did not revolt against British rule. Now, Spain, um, which owns <laughs> Louisiana now, uh, and the city of New Orleans, remember it's all together, Spain was sympathetic to the United States, but it never became an official uh, ally of the United States. Now, uh, Gal Galvez was very sympathetic to the Americans, um, and he did a number of things that unofficially helped the Americans. Um, he encouraged the growth of their commerce on the Mississippi River. He allowed the Americans free access to the river. Um, he sold critically needed supplies to the Americans. Uh, including an American merchant by the name of Oliver. Uh, and those things, uh, Oliver then uh, sent, on it, sent on their way to Washington and the Continental Army. So a lot of what Washington used actually began life in Spanish Louisiana. Um, the Spanish and Galvez loaned money to the United States. Uh, Galvez and the Spanish allowed Spanish guns, cannon, rifles, pistols, Spanish guns and gunpowder and other supplies to be sent to uh, George Rogers Clark in the old Northwest. Uh, Clark was fighting the British up in that area, up and now what is now Ohio, Indiana, oh, uh, now, let me do it like this. Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Wisconsin, and Michigan. Military. Uh, he strengthened the Spanish defenses in Spanish Louisiana. He built gunboats, homemade gunboats, uh, to patrol the Mississippi River in case British ships would show up. And he repaired the fortifications that previous French and Spanish governors uh, had built. And there was a need for those actions, for all of those actions, actually, because the British strengthened their forts at Natchez and Baton Rouge and Biomanchac. Now, all three of those locations were on the east bank of the Mississippi River. And... Uh, in acknowledgement that the Spanish were much more willing to help, uh, to uh, that, no, let me say it this way, they were willing to oppose the British. And as a result, uh, Spain and England actually go to war during the American Revolution. So the American Revolution truly is a, a world war, isn't it? Now, Galvez had his eye on the Spanish uh, in uh, uh, Galvez had his eye, eyes on the British in Baton Rouge. Um, and he developed plans uh, that he would put into place if 
Spain would go to war with England. And of course, I just told you, they eventually did. They did it in spring of 1779. And so Galvez puts his plan into place. He gathers up this uh, pretty ragged looking <laughs> fleet of boats. He loads them with supplies. He loads them with uh, weapons and ammunition, um, and uh, it begins to sail up the Mississippi River, uh, heading toward Baton Rouge. Now, he also had an army, small, but nevertheless, an army um, composed of a mix of white uh, subjects, because remember, the Spanish are not citizens, they're subjects, uh, white subjects and free black subjects. It was about 650-man army that left New Orleans. It was an international because people were remember that army from all over the world. And it was a multiracial uh, group as well. Uh, they had bad roads. They had very little equipment. They had very few qualified officers. Now, uh, you have traveled uh, between New Orleans and Baton Rouge on Interstate 10. Um, and you've looked out into that swamp and you've wondered how in the world did they ever build the super highway? Well, take that thought a little bit further. How in the world did Galvez get that army from New Orleans to Baton Rouge by marching through that swamp? Uh, fortunately, Galvez was joined. He started out from New Orleans with about 650 men. Fortunately, he was joined along the way by an additional 700 local people who joined him as he passed through that area. And so he winds up with an army of about 1,400. Now, that's the largest that he got because it almost immediately began to lose people. Disease and hardship and injuries uh, dropped that number to about 1,000. Uh, but it was still a good number, especially when you consider that um, the British at Baton Rouge only had about 400 regular soldiers and about 150 set, uh, settlers and slaves who were supporting the British at uh, Baton Rouge. Um, Galvez and his army and his old navy captured the city of Baton Rouge on, in September of 1779. Now, this was significant because it prevented the British forces from establishing uh, a really strong uh, military presence in the lower Mississippi River Valley. It paved the way for further uh, later American immigration into the area. Um, and it once again proved that Galvez uh, was had a lot of military talent. Now, so Galvez in charge of the Spanish, now turns his eyes uh, on the, uh, the literal Gulf Coast, the cities of Mobile and Pensacola. Both of those cities uh, are a part of British Florida. Now, before he ever even attacked Baton Rouge, Galvez had put spies in Mobile and in Pensacola. And after the successful Baton Rouge campaign, Galvez began to plan uh, how he would go about taking Mobile and Pensacola away from the British. He marches about a, a sizable army for that time, an army of about 2,000 men. He marches that army uh, over to Mobile. Uh, and if you think that trip from New Orleans to Baton Rouge was tough, can you imagine how tough it was from New Orleans to Mobile? Those of you who have taken the I-10 trip between New Orleans and Mobile know what I'm talking about. Uh, in March of 1780, the city of Mobile surrendered to Galvez and his Spanish army. Um, then he turns his eyes to Pensacola. Now, of the three cities... Baton Rouge, Mobile, and Pensacola. Pensacola has the most British soldiers. There are about 2,000 British soldiers uh, at Pensacola. Now, of course, Galvez knows this, and he knows he's got to be reinforced. So Galvez 
goes to Havana, Cuba, which is owned by the Spanish. And he gathers further soldiers and he returns to Pensacola. He sails with that, uh, those reinforcements from Havana to Pensacola. Now, uh, interestingly enough, there is a sandbar that kept uh, large ships from sailing into Pensacola Bay. Now, a little boat could do it, but a big boat would literally drown, uh, ground, ground itself on the uh, on the sandbar. And the sandbar was keeping uh, the naval portion of Galvez's force from uh, really being able to position themselves where they could effectively attack Pensacola. Well, Galvez found a way for the lighter ships to come in. Um, fundamentally, what he did was he unloaded the big ships and loaded those cargoes, those men, those guns, all that stuff, onto the smaller boats. And then they were able to sail across the sandbar. They were joined, uh, Galvez was joined at Pensacola by some additional Spanish soldiers who had marched overland from Mobile. So by the time that he really attacked Pensacola, he has about 3,500 men. So he uh, has not quite, but almost twice as many soldiers as the British do. Now, he attacks Pensacola, but he's unable to take Pensacola. And so the, uh, the action uh, turns into a siege. He fundamentally has Pensacola surrounded. Nothing can get, no food or water can get into Pensacola. Nothing can leave Pensacola. So he's literally waiting for the British soldiers in Pensacola who either starve to death or die from dehydration. Um, and as a result, in the spring, in May of 1781, the British at Pensacola surrender. Now, he has had three campaigns against the British, and he's won all three, right? Baton Rouge, Mobile, Pensacola. As a reward for his military success, uh, the Spanish king promotes Galvez to lieutenant general and transfers him. Uh, he's now a big shot down in Venezuela or something, right? Now, Governor uh, Governor Galvez, uh, the lieutenant had a lieutenant governor, and that lieutenant governor his name was Esteban Miro. Esteban, right? Stephen. Uh, Esteban Miro. That's M I R O. And from all that we know, Miro was a very competent person himself. Um, he acted as acting governor uh, while. Galvez was away on campaign. On campaign. Now, uh, he let Galvez take care of the, mil the military stuff, and he took care of the civilian stuff. For example, he encouraged greater immigration into the colony of Louisiana. He increased he increased trade and commerce. While he was the acting governor of Louisiana, he kept the Indians at peace, which was a big deal. Uh, he offered help to the settlers uh, in a similar fashion to what Galvez had previously done. And he took an accurate census. By the way, um, he found that the, that the population of New Orleans was about 5,000. And that the total population of the total colony of Louisiana, including New Orleans, was about 30,000. So 25,000 plus New Orleans. Um, he accomplished other things while he was the acting governor. For example, he established a trading post uh, from which grew the present day city of Monroe. Uh, he continued to keep peace with the Indians. Um, he continued to trade with France, especially the French islands in the Caribbean. Um, he lowered tax rate. 
tariffs on things that were imported into Louisiana and were exported out of Louisiana. Now, in 1788, disaster struck the city of New Orleans. The city burned. It almost burned to the ground. Uh, it was mostly a wooden city. Um, Miro immediately began to rebuild the city. Now, there are very few buildings that survived that fire. Um, if you are... Uh, familiar with the city of New Orleans, you know that there's a really neat restaurant uh, near, not at, but near the French market, what we now call the French market, and it's called the Napoleon House, and it, they make the best, <laughs> the very best hot roast beef, hot roast beef po'boys you ever would like to eat. That building is one of the few buildings in New Orleans that can be dated to before the fire of 1788. And the reason it survived is it's solid brick. Miro immediately began to build the city. Uh, among the new buildings there on the levee um, was that first French market. Uh, so fresh food, uh, fresh fruits and meat and vegetables to the cities. Most of the buildings of the new city, the rebuilt city, were made of brick and stone instead of wood. Um, and the architectural style of the newly rebuilt city was in the Caribbean style. Uh, so, even though we refer to that old part of town as the French Quarter, uh, the architecture is not French at all. Uh, it is Spanish, specifically. It is Spanish Caribbean style architecture. Uh, another census was conducted in 1788, the year of the Great Fire. There were now 34,000 uh, uh, subjects living in the entire uh, colony. Now, Miro, though, was getting old. Uh, and he requested that he be relieved, and his wish was granted. He wanted to go home to Spain to die uh, in, in Spain. And his wishes were granted in 1791, uh, and he returned to Spain. Now, he was replaced by another uh, first-class administrator uh, by the name of Carondelet. That, uh, those of you who are from New Orleans and who travel in New Orleans certainly recognize that name. Carondelet, C-A-R-O-N-D-E-L-E-T, Carondelet. Rondelet was well-liked, he was well-respected, um, and he was the first one to divide the city of New Orleans into four pieces, and he called them wards. There were four of them at the beginning. Now, we know there are more than four wards now, but originally only four. Uh, in 1791, uh, he created a system of night watchmen whose real job it was to uh, give the alarm about fire, uh, but who uh, sort of um, evolved over the years, not into a fire department, but into the New Orleans Police Department. So the night watchman eventually became uh, an OPD. Uh, he installed street lights. Now, they were not bright electric lights like we have now. Obviously, they were, uh, they were uh, the fuel was oil. Uh, and they were rather dim, but hey, it, uh, some light is better than no light. S something that was very important also happened during Coronelit's governorship. Uh, the first banks appear in New Orleans. Now, the first banks uh, were not French banks, and they were not Spanish banks. They were United States banks. Uh, because the city of New Orleans and the Mississippi River were becoming so very, very important to the United States uh, that it was felt that it would expedite trade if there were U.S., if there were American banks there. And that's exactly what happens. Uh, American banks open uh, what we would call branches in the city of New Orleans. 
Rondelet gets there in 1791. Now, a couple of years prior to his arrival, the French Revolution had broken out uh, in France. Um, many of the French people who, and there were still many French who lived in Louisiana, they were never really happy under Spanish rule. They dreamed of the day when somehow uh, Louisiana would be returned to uh, French control. Now, when the French Revolution takes place in 1789, many of the Louisiana French see this, they hope at least, that this is um, the beginning of the end for the Spanish in Louisiana and that the French uh, will take over Louisiana again. The problem, of course, is that in 1793, France and Spain go to war against each other. Carondelet, now he's the governor, and he has almost total power. So what does Carondelet do? He forbids Louisianians from discussing events in France under the threat of punishment. So. Uh, what's happening with the French Revolution cannot be discussed in Louisiana under the penalty of, of serious punishment. Now, most people had enough sense to keep their mouths shut, but some uh, insisted on continuing to try to stir up trouble, and about 70 of those broke the rules, uh, broke Carondelet's uh, gag rules, what we would call it today. Most of those 70 were expelled from the colony. They were just kicked out and told not to come back. If you don't like it here, go live somewhere else. But six of them were actually sent to prison in Havana. Um, and you don't want to wind up in a Spanish prison in Havana. It was almost a death sentence. So Carondelet was serious about uh, no talking about the French Revolution. Now, Carondelet did other things as well. Remember, they're, they're at war with Spain. Uh, he built a fort downriver from New Orleans. Uh, it's still there, by the way, Fort St. Philip. He repaired many of the fortifications that previous, once again, fr previous French and Spanish uh, governors had built. And he reorganized the militia companies, uh, trained them, drilled them, made them into pretty competent military organizations just in case uh, we uh, Louisiana was attacked uh, by the French or the English or whoever. Now, in April of 1795, word was received in New Orleans of a slave uprising at Point Coupee Parish. Now, let me spell that one for you. Some of you know it. You live there, right? Point, P-O-I-N-T-E, Coupe, C-O-U-P-E, Point Coupe. Uh, it's north of Baton Rouge. It's on the west bank of the river, north of Baton Rouge. Uh, a number of slaves uh, had uh, revolted against their masters. Um, the whites received word of that revolt um, and white armed whites went out to meet the slaves were literally marching toward New Orleans uh, the whites went out armed uh, uh, with modern firearms or you know muskets and pistols and um, and they put down the uprising 23 of the slaves were hung uh, and then they were decapitated now, that sounds a little like a little bit like overkill, right? They were they were hung, then they were had their heads chopped off, and then their heads were displayed on poles every mile along the Mississippi River between New Orleans and Baton Rouge. Uh, and we know we we call those mile markers, don't we? Today on the interstates, uh, you know, you, you break down, you call triple A, and they say, "Where are you?" And you say, "Well, I'm at mark, I'm at mile marker 148." And that's what we're talking about. Those existed then, except 
uh, the number of the river, was, the, the mile marker on the river was chiseled in stone. Um, even the slaves who were not executed were whipped brutally and given life sentences at even harder labor, if you can imagine what harder labor could, what could be worse than working on a sugar cane plantation. All right, let's talk about the final years of colonial Louisiana. Uh, by 1800, the colony of Louisiana, and remember, that's the whole thing, uh, had about 50,000 residents, and 10,000 of those 50,000 lived in the city of New Orleans. Now, why had the population, because that was a pretty healthy population growth. Why did it happen? Well, you know the answers already. We've already mentioned some of these. Uh, the Spanish encouraged immigration. Um, many uh, British loyalists during the American Revolution uh, who had opposed the United States, who favored the British, the so-called loyalists, many of them had moved to Louisiana. Uh, there was a large increase in slave numbers in Louisiana as well. Remember, we've talked about this a lot, and we'll continue to talk about it. Uh, remember that prior to the perfection of the uh, cotton gin, uh, the cultivation of cotton was not that common. But once that gin was created, 1795, 1796, uh, the cultivation of cotton just mushroomed and went right through the roof. And of course, uh, cotton cultivation required huge numbers, uh, huge amounts of labor, uh, and most of that labor, if not all of that labor, was slave labor. So you can understand why the slave numbers uh, increased so much. Um, uh, some of the Cajuns are still trickling into Louisiana. Uh, the Islanos are still trickling into uh, Louisiana. Um, the Haitians were making their appearance in Louisiana at, a, at roughly this time. Okay, remember the story. Uh, well, no, we haven't told the story yet. Uh, the story is that Napoleon would uh, w was well on his way to establishing an empire in Europe. He was he had conquered almost all of Europe, Western Europe especially, except for England, um, and. Then he turns his eyes to the Western Hemisphere, where he desires to create a Western Hemisphere empire. Um, uh, Louisiana is going to, in his mind, is going to play a huge role in that French empire. And it's all going to be financed through the selling of, uh, of sugar from the island of Haiti. Uh, uh, Haiti was a Caribbean sugar island. And the French, uh, and it belonged to France, uh, and the French were making a killing uh, off the uh, sugar cane and the sugar industry from Haiti. So the money from Haiti was going to finance what, uh, the, the creation of the, of the empire on the mainland. Now, no one exactly knew what was in Louisiana. Not really. They had some idea. No one, for example, knew that there was oil and gas and sulfur and salt. But they knew that there were valuable fur-bearing animals. Uh, and, and so and, and many people were getting filthy rich just off uh, fur-bearing animals like beaver, muskrat. No nutria yet. That's a 20th century in, introduction. The Haitian, uh, the Haitian slaves, the slaves of Haiti, rebelled against their white French masters and took over the island and, and proclaimed that Haiti was now the Republic of Haiti. Well, Napoleon was not going to put up with that. And so he sent a French army to Haiti with every expectation that he would very easily put down the revolution of the French, of the Haitian slaves. Matter of fact, he sent his brother-in-law 
General Leclerc, L-E-C-L-E-R-C, as the commander of that army. The problem was that when the French get to Haiti, the same thing happens to the French when they get to Haiti that happened to the American Indians when uh, the Europeans first got to the Western Hemisphere. Remember what happened to the Indians? They all started dying uh, after being exposed to all of these diseases for which they had no immunity. Well, the same thing in reverse happens in Haiti. The Frenchmen have no immunity to the tropical diseases that they encounter on the island of Haiti. And so, between dying like flies from disease and dying like flies from being killed by the Haitian soldiers, the French army literally puts its tail up between its legs and sail away to England, uh, to France. They give up and they leave so many dead behind. And among, that, among the dead is General Leclerc, uh, Napoleon's brother-in-law. He dies, we think, of yellow fever that he contracts there in Haiti. So, many of the slave owners of Haiti um, move to Cuba, uh, where slavery still exists, and then later from Cuba to Louisiana. Some of them actually moved directly from Haiti to Louisiana, but a lot of white Haitians and their slaves um, uh, either very quickly or eventually appear in Louisiana. Now, and there are a lot of Americans. Uh, the westward movement, uh, the movement uh, on the frontier uh, toward the west, uh, never, <laughs> pretty much never slows down, uh, especially after the end of the American Revolution. Now, So what do we have in 1795? The Spanish still own all of the colony of Louisiana that's located west of the Mississippi River, and they own New Orleans. Remember, New Orleans is the only part of the Louisiana of Louisiana that's located east of the river. And remember what international law says. If a country uh, controls both sides of the river, then that country has the legal right to control their traffic on the river. Well, Spain, uh, New Orleans is not a big place, but they own Spain, they own New Orleans, and then they own obviously what's on the West Bank. So legally, the Spanish can control uh, the Mississippi River, which means that theoretically. The Spanish can ruin the United States financially because so much of the goods that are grown in the United States are floating down the Mississippi River, from the Missouri River into the Mississippi River, from the Ohio River into the Mississippi River, all the way down, all the way to New Orleans. And then when it gets to New Orleans, it is stored until the next big seagoing vessel gets here. It's loaded from the warehouse onto the big seagoing vessel, and then it goes to the rest of the world. And the Spanish, if they choose to, can mess that up big time, legally. So, in 1795, uh, President Washington, he's still the president, Washington sends a man by the name of Thomas Pinckney, P-I-N-C-K-N-E-Y. Thomas Pinckney goes to Madrid in Spain to try to uh, uh, create a treaty between the United States and Spain in which the Spanish promise not to close off the traffic on the Mississippi River. Now, there are some other issues here. For example, the Spanish have always claimed that the northern boundary of Florida was up around Vicksburg while the United States had always insisted that it was uh, a lot further south than that. It was the 31st parallel. Well, this, well, this was a significant issue because if the Spanish uh, were right, 
and the, and the northern boundary of Florida was near up near Vicksburg. That means that Florida just got bigger, right? And if the Americans were right, uh, and uh, it was down near the 31st parallel, that means that Florida was smaller and the United States was larger. So Pinckney is uh, ordered to try to settle that boundary issue uh, as well. And uh, Pinckney is successful. It's one, in fact, it's one of the most successful treaties that we ever signed with any country. Uh, the 31st parallel is, in fact, decided upon by both nations as the northern boundary of Florida. Uh, United States citizens are guaranteed navigation of the Louisiana, of, uh, I'm sorry, of the Mississippi River without being uh, harassed by the Spanish. And a new Spanish, uh, and, and, and later, uh, a new Spanish governor was named. His name was Lemos, L-E-M-O-S, Manuel Lemos. Um, we, don't, we don't spend a lot of time talking about Governor Lemos because it was rather sad. From all we know, he was very capable uh, and got a lot accomplished. The problem is that he dies natural death after only being governor two years. So we really don't know what he would have accomplished had he lived longer. For example, uh, in New Orleans, he created a garbage pickup system. Boy, if anything was needed in New Orleans, it was a garbage pick pickup system. Now, it was primitive, uh, but it was much, much better than what they had, which was absolutely nothing. So, two years, uh, 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 Lemos uh, gets there in 1797. He dies in 1799. He's replaced by a fellow by the name of, by the name of Salcedo. S-A-L-C-E-D-O. Now, Salcedo was not the friend of the Americans that many of the other Spanish governors uh, Pinckney's Treaty had uh, the two nations had agreed, uh, Spain and the United States had agreed uh, that for a three-year period, the Spanish promised not to close down the Mississippi River. Well, that was in 1795, right? Well, here it is, 1799, and that three-year period has passed, and so Salcedo suspends the right, what was called the right of deposit. He, he closes the Mississippi River down to American business. Now, let me say it again. Americans, especially living on the western frontier, absolutely depended on shipping goods to New Orleans and then having them transshipped to the rest of the world. And American frontiersmen began to uh, talk seriously about uh, attacking New Orleans and taking it away from the Spanish. Well, that never had a chance to develop, and we can blame it once again on our old friend Napoleon. We've said that Napoleon had it in his mind to create this Western Hemisphere uh, uh, empire, and of course we've said it didn't take place, and we've talked about why. But before the Haitian Revolution takes place, okay, let's go back a little further. Before the Haitian Revolution takes place, um, or at about the same time that the Haitian Revolution takes place, Napoleon is invading all of his neighbors, including Spain. You look on a map, France and Spain share a border. And of course, Spain was the uh, was the weakest one of the two. France was very powerful militarily. Spain, not so much. And so Spain was really unable to defend itself, and Spain really could not uh, resist the French. Now, Napoleon forces the Spanish to sign a new treaty. Now, the Spanish don't like it at all, but there's nothing they can do about it. And the name of this treaty is the Treaty of San Ildefonso. Let me spell that one for you. I-L-D-E 
F O N S O S O O. Okay, let me do it again. I L D E F O N S O. The Treaty of San Ildefonso. And it was a secret treaty, by the way. <laughs> no one knew that Napoleon had forced the Spanish to give Louisiana back to France. Now, in the meantime, remember, please, it takes two or three, sometimes four months for a ship from uh, America to get back to Paris or London. In the meantime, while, while all of this is going down, Jefferson becomes very concerned um, about uh, the idea that the very militaristic Napoleon might get Louisiana back. What well, he doesn't know that Napoleon has got it back. And Thomas Jefferson, President Thomas Jefferson, sends uh, some American diplomats to Paris to try to purchase New Orleans. Remember what the rule is. If a nation owns both sides of the river, they can control the river. Well, now, I mean, uh, France does own both sides of the river. Jefferson doesn't know it yet, but they do. And so what Jefferson wants to do is to buy New Orleans because that would take New Orleans out of the picture. And that means that would mean that France only owned one side of the river and therefore they could not legally shut the river down. So he sends two main diplomats to Paris. Those two men, uh, their names are Robert Livingston and James Monroe. He sends them with the purpose of buying New Orleans. Uh, Jefferson wanted New Orleans. Maybe it, well, it, actually, what he wanted was uh, New Orleans and as much of the surrounding territory as the French were selling. Okay. Um, at first, the French were indifferent to the idea. Uh, they were much more powerful militarily uh, and navally, for that matter, uh, than the United States, and uh, they uh, they started to look down their noses at the United States. But, but, uh, while those two diplomats are in Paris, uh, sort of being ignored by the French, the French receive word of the terrible uh, results of the Haitian Revolution. And uh, Napoleon realizes that his dream of a Western uh, Hemisphere empire is never going to take place. And so Napoleon changes his tune. Now, there were some other reasons why Napoleon changes his tune. Uh, but the big reason was that he, he no longer had the means to finance it, right? Uh, he realized that the Americans were going to continue to expand into Louisiana. He knew that. It's just a matter of time. Uh, he knew he didn't have the military resources uh, needed to hold a colony as big as Louisiana. Remember, Louisiana went all the way to the Canadian border and all the way to the Rocky Mountains. It was hard to govern to govern a colony from literally thousands of miles away. And so, one day the American diplomats were shocked when the French foreign minister, sort of like uh, our Secretary of State, okay, uh, not a great analogy, but an adequate analogy, uh, the, uh, the French foreign secretary, his name was Talleyrand, T-A-L-L-E-Y-R-A-N-D. Talleyrand walk, uh, walks into the French into the American office and says, and drops a bombshell and says, would you like to buy Louisiana? Now, well, Livingston and Monroe were sort of caught between a rock and a hard spot. Uh, they knew within reason that Jefferson would approve the United States buying Louisiana. But once again, the distance, remember that's two, three, four months away from Washington, D.C., uh, separating Washington, D.C., from uh, from Paris. And so the diplomats had to make a decision on their own. They did not have time to write to Jefferson and get permission and get the answer back. They had to make a decision right now. Uh, 
because if they if they waited too long, Napoleon might make the offer to someone else. So they accept the offer, and Spain sells Louisiana. Uh, France, <laughs> boy, boy, France sells Louisiana to the Americans for. $15 million. Now, it was actually $20 million, And let me explain why. It was $15 million cash. Plus, the French, French citizens owed American citizens about $5 million in claims and debts. Um, and so, uh, the treaty that transfers uh, ownership of Louisiana from France to the United States um, Includes those two things, $15 million in cash, $5 million in French debt that is forgiven, that is sort of wiped off the books. And so the agreement was signed in May of 1803. Uh, Congress, once the word was received, it takes a while, right? But once Congress receives word of the Louisiana Purchase, they very quickly approve it. Um, and as a result of that, Louisiana's colonial days were over. Remember, we had been a colony of France, then Spain, and then back to France. But when we were purchased by the United States, the people who lived in Louisiana instantly made that transition from being subjects to being citizens. And the first governor of the territory of Louisiana was a man by the name of William Claiborne. That's another familiar uh, name to you if you are familiar with New Orleans or especially if you live in New Orleans. Now, the official transfer of the territory uh, takes place in December of 1803. It takes place in New Orleans uh, at the Place des Arms. Right? Uh, we don't call it that anymore. We call it Jackson Square. It's the same thing, right? Uh, right there in front of the uh, St. Louis Cathedral uh, is uh, the Place des Armes. Uh, as a matter of fact, the official document that transferred ownership from France to the United States was signed in the Cabildo. Uh, and Jefferson named William Claiborne as the uh, new territorial governor. Now, what was the extent? What were the physical boundaries of the territory of Louisiana? Well, uh, some thought that it included Texas. Well, I don't think so. Uh, Texas had been a, 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 uh, owned by Spain and then uh, uh, and, and so long that a claim by the Americans that the Louisiana Purchase included uh, Texas was probably uh, ridiculous, but some did try to claim it. Others thought they went even further overboard. They said that Louisiana went all the way to the, to the Pacific Ocean. Well, no, that's patently ridiculous. Others thought that it went way up into Canada and took in most of what we now call Western Canada. Um, Monroe and Livingston wondered what the boundaries were. Uh, and they asked Talleyrand, they asked Foreign Secretary, French Foreign Secretary Talleyrand, what are the boundaries of Louisiana? And he laughed at them. He said, uh, you just bought whatever it is that you are powerful enough to control. Well, as it turned out, uh, the roughly, roughly, the boundaries of Louisiana uh, were the Canadian border, uh, the uh, Rocky Mountains uh, and uh, in the, on the southwest border it was pretty much the Red River. The Red River today uh, serves as generally, generally as the boundary between the states of Texas and the state, and the state of Oklahoma. No matter how big it was, it was bigger. If you put England and Germany and Italy and Portugal and Spain together, it was bigger than that. That's how big the Louisiana Purchase was. 
uh, it contains great natural resources, minerals, uh, land that would prove to be so rich, you could grow anything there, a lot of timber, a lot of navigable streams where you could uh, you could travel by boat in those days before roads became common, uh, had immense amounts of fresh water in it. Now, neither France nor Spain had successfully economically developed Louisiana. Uh, they never had the money. They never had the industrial power. They never had the people to do that. But the Americans were already famous around the world for being so mobile. Americans began moving west as soon as the first settlers arrived at Plymouth Rock, right? We had been moving west ever since then, and that didn't change. Americans uh, continued, and Amer Americans were already in uh, Spanish and French Louisiana, and they continued to come in now that it was owned by their own country. Matter of fact, uh, population movement into the Louisiana Purchase not only continued, it accelerated after the American Revolution was over. Uh, settlers, remember, America is still an agricultural economy. Uh, and many and most of the people were farmers, small farmers, medium farmers, ginormous farmers, but nevertheless farmers. And they were drawn by the promise of of this extraordinarily rich farmland that existed in the Louisiana Purchase. Now, 1803 is when uh, the U.S. buys Louisiana from France. And in that year, there were about 30, I'm sorry, wrong number, 50,000 residents who were living in the entire uh, territory of Louisiana. Uh, between a third and a, and a half of them were black. Uh, and they were composed of two groups. There were the slaves, most of them, most of that number uh, were slaves. But there was also a respectable number of what we like to call free people of color. They were Africans who, by whatever the method, had become free. And they were referred to as free people of color. And when you look in the old census record from the early 1800s, quite often next to a man's name, you'll see simply the letters F P uh, F M C free man of color. Or if it's a woman, it'll say free. It'll say F W C free woman of color. Now in 1803, when Louisiana became a territory, even though there were 50,000 people, most of those people lived in the very southern part of the of the territory. They lived in what is today Louisiana. Now, there were some who lived much further north, uh, but most of them lived in what today is Louisiana, and most of them lived along the navigable rivers and streams of Louisiana that made it somewhat easier for them to travel, travel by boat, right, travel by water, uh, in a day when there were no roads to speak of. All right, let's talk about New Orleans in 1803. Uh, it was a small place. It consisted mostly of what we still call the French Quarter, the Old Quarter, the Vieux Carré, right? Uh, and, uh, and it was mostly uh, French and Spanish, the Creoles. Uh, now, let's define a Creole again. For our purposes, a Creole is a white European, a white person who can track his ancestors back to Europe, generally, back to France, back to Spain. Now, today, when we talk about Creoles, quite often we're talking about something totally different, aren't we? Today, when we talk about a Creole, we very well might be talking about a person of mixed race, black and white, black and, black and Indian. Indian and white, right? Uh, but so we need to draw the distinction between uh, what those people consider themselves to be. If you were a white Frenchman or a Spaniard, you considered yourself to be a Creole. 
So most of the people who lived in New Orleans in 1803 were, in fact, European Creoles. More Americans were moving in, though. And it won't be long. It wouldn't be long before a lot of Americans were in New Orleans. And this is going to cause an entirely new set of problems for the city of New Orleans. Um, new Orleans had been chosen by Bienville, uh, that he had chosen the location uh, upon which to build the city. Um, and it's higher than the surrounding ground, but that doesn't mean that it's high. It wasn't up on a big, tall bluff, 15, 20, 50, 100 feet above uh, the Mississippi River, for example, like Natchez is, or Vicksburg, or even Baton Rouge. Uh, the defenses of New Orleans uh, after the American Revolution had fallen into disrepair. Uh, drainage ditches. Water was always a problem. It had to be drained off. It had to be sent somewhere. So a, a, a system of drainage ditches have been uh, dug in, Louis, in uh, New Orleans to help the city drain. The problem was that people got lazy. And remember we said that a garbage pickup system had been created uh, toward the end of the Spanish colonial period? Well, much of that garbage had been dumped into the drainage ditches, good gracious, and clogged them to the point where they were no longer able to function. Uh, streets were unpaved. They were full of garbage. Uh, people tended to, even though a garbage pickup officially existed, the reality was that uh, if it existed at all, it was uh, erratic, sporadic. Uh, chamber pots uh, were emptied from the upstairs windows. Uh, and uh, shame on you if you were unlucky to be walking by when they emptied the chamber pot uh, of the urine and feces, right? Because that's what we're talking about. That's what the chamber pot was for. The city stank. It was, it was beyond filthy. And as a result, and the lack of sanitation was one of the major causes of diseases in New Orleans. Now, New Orleans was not the only city to face these problems. Uh, other cities in America still were just really nasty. But New Orleans was far enough south, it was sort of semi-tropical. Uh, and it had the additional problems of things like mosquitoes. Not just mosquitoes, but disease-carrying mosquitoes. There were only four or five general stores, and we're coming to 1803 now. There were only uh, four or five general stores. There were a couple of banks. Uh, there were eight or ten uh, warehouses where uh, the goods were stored before they were shipped on to the rest of the world. There were some small shops in the quarter, uh, specialty stores. Uh, I've read that it, it was amazing. Uh, that in such a small, nasty little town, uh, you could walk into some stores and it uh, they had all kinds of stuff from all over the world. And we're talking about fancy, expensive stuff. So it was there, but it was only available to the people who could afford it. Uh, things like wines and olive oil and exotic fruits, right? Jewelry. You could find it in New Orleans. Uh, remember, it's 1803. It's only been eight years since the cotton gin was perfected. Uh, and cotton clothing has not become normal. Now, I'm sitting here lecturing to you tonight. I'm dressed, almost everything I have on is cotton from the, from the inside out, right? But not so then. Uh, most of the fabric that men and women used in their clothing was either wool or linen. Um, and although it's beautiful, it's also just really hot. Uh, the styles of the day had that high collar, uh, those really thick ties, uh, thick coats quite often with a vest, uh, boots for the men all the way up to almost up to the knees. It must have been miserable. Look, I'm recording this lecture on the third day of September. And the high today was 93 in September. 
So we, as Louisianians, we know what it's like in July and August. Don't we? Okay, that's a good place to stop. Uh, this is the end of what I'm calling Lecture 3A, um, and I'll see you soon with Lecture 4.